Hi. So, in this video I'm going to show you how to build this kit um, that I produced. Uh, briefly, it's it's basically a little speaker kit for your Eurorack synthesizer. It's um, pretty simple to build and doesn't cost much at all. Uh, there's not many parts, so um, you're not going to be spending ages trying to put it together and uh, getting lost and then just failing. So it's quite gives you quite fast gratification. Um, this is what you get. It's a full kit uh, in this bag. And you'll receive promotional junk like a sticker and a speaker, um, the full component kit, a panel made from PCB and the little PCB, power cable correctly wired and a wire to connect the PCB to the speaker. Um, let me show you where, so if you look on the front of the bag there's actually no instructions in the bag because it's much better to um, have it online because if there are any changes or updates needed it's much easier. Um, so you need to go to this address. I'll just show you on the computer. Go to this website. Clactronics.co.uk forward slash Euroclack. If I browse it for you. At the moment there's only one thing on there which is this kit. The mini speaker kit. And you currently there's a small image of it. There's going to be more stuff coming online soon, but the basic things that you need for building the kit are there right at the moment. So there's a bomb, so this tells you where all the components go, and uh, assembly instructions. So if you don't like videos, which I don't like very much, but some people find them quite useful, so I'm doing this. Um, there's sort of a step by step guide how to put it together. But if you know what you're doing, you could even just um, you can even just look at this and uh, use the designators to see where all the parts go. Now, with this video, we could follow this, but I will also show you that the um, PCB program that designed this um, project also has a useful add-on called iBomb. It gives you this reference, it shows you where all the parts go. So we'll be using that during the uh, build video. So go to this view. We can now, now see, just get sorted. Let's um, get rid of all these we don't need uh, the front panel or the speaker or anything at the moment. We just need these two, the component bag and the PCB. That's where we'll start. Now the tools you'll need can be quite simple. You might find you need some other tools. Um, but the most basic things you need are cutters, a soldering iron, a decent soldering iron, doesn't have to be like a few hundred pounds um, soldering station, but it it'd be good if you could make sure it's proper. Some solder and wire cutters. I don't know if I said that already. Now, if we look at the um, component kit, let's get more view. Careful, there's lots of small parts. So you get ICs, these are electrolytic capacitors, so two small ones and a big one. Two resistors, 
the 3.5 audio jack, power jet socket, here's three film capacitors, pot, potentiometer, the knob for the pot, fixing nuts for the pot, you get six screws, four are, gun four are for um, attaching the speaker to the panel and two are for attaching it to your rack, four little nuts for the speaker, oh and this is the uh, hex nut for the jack, and that's it. So, if you look on the website, we'll just have it in a little side view. And go to the top. I recommend a particular order because um, the wire part, you can see my mouse there, this wire part can get in the be hard to fit if you put this larger electrolytic in place. So we'll we'll do this order. Now let's zoom this out. It's really important that you notice that the silk screen, the lines and stuff, is the where the component the top side where the components go in. So if you notice all of these parts on the component side are on this side but the jack and the pot go on the other side. Now you might notice that these are, look a bit strange, like why are they the same? Well the way this this um, module is designed is you can make the jack or the pot go either way around. Let me just show you that quickly. See the panel? It's the same on both sides. If you notice, there's a small hole and a big hole, and the small holes are either on the right or it's on the left. Now that is so the jack can either go on the left, or if you flip it over, the jack could be on the right. That means if you build two, you could have a system where you've got one panel on the left like this. Let me just find another panel. and one panel on the right like this. So it might be quite neat. Um, primarily though, it's des my design is jack on the left and a uh, pot on the right, which is the knob like this, you see. Um, because, because this is made in a PC manufacturing house, it's quite hard to stop them from putting numbers, putting the board numbers in weird places so unfortunately the this way round you might find a funny marking but it doesn't really affect its um, functionality it's just aesthetics so we'll show this at the time when it comes up to it but this the jack and the pot can go either way around in the PCB so it's on this side so this can go either in here or this can go in here and the jack could either go in here or here. So you have to decide which way round you want to do it before you commit to this, because it's quite hard to remove them. But we don't have to think about that just yet. First we'll do all the components, and then we'll get to that and talk about it a bit more. So, I recommend first, that focus, yeah. I recommend first we put in these resistors just push all this aside. So, the resistors are R1 and R2. If you look here, if we look on the I bomb. See them here and here. So R1 is 470k. So that is that is um, the one right here. 
So, 470k is yellow, purple, black, and orange. See? The numbers, I don't... I don't know, uh, if you don't know, the numbers and um, the colours represent which um, number it is. I won't go into details on it, but look up, in Google, look up Google resistor codes if you don't understand what I mean. So, 470k is R1. So I'll fold that up and put it in. and fold them over. If you fold them over like this, they will um, hold in and you won't have to worry about it when you're soldering. Now it's only uh, one other resistor, so by deduction that goes in R2. But just to know, this is brown, brown, black, black, gold, which is one, zero, zero, let me remember, divide by 10, that makes 10. And that just goes in the other one, R2. That's this one. Now we'll just solder those. Also again, I can't go into detail of how you solder. You just need to practice. Don't worry too much about these components. These are quite a good component to start off on. There's no polarity, for example. It doesn't matter which way around the parts go in. You, you just um, heat the joint and put the solder in. If you want some more details, I think there's quite good information by Adafruit. There's certainly a lot of videos on YouTube you can search. Okay. And then we get the cutters and cut those wires off. Like that. Anyway. Now. I recommend, let me just check if I remember, I recommend doing the wire now, see, because we don't want it to come, we want it to be the easiest thing to put in. So here's the wire, now you can just strip them with these, it's alright, but if you've got the tools, you could use an automatic wire stripper. We're only going to do one end, just cutting like five millimeters about off the end. Now you see the wire; it's got a white stripe on one of the wires. It's not; it doesn't mean anything really. But if you put the white stripe into positive, that's just kind of a standard. So. As a little gimmicky feature, the board has holes so you can for restraining the wire. I mean, it's not much a huge problem, but I just did it anyway. I'm just going to put those in. So feed the wire through the hole, and then down. There's good pictures on the website. It's quite hard to show on a live webcam. I didn't twist those wires enough. Be really careful that the wire doesn't splay. There we go. So it looks like this. And then underneath, you can just bend these down flat. Bit long there, doesn't really matter. 
Just be careful it doesn't touch this pad. Now, I can probably solder under the microscope. Big blobs. Okay. So it looks like this. Now, if you pull on the wire, it's not going to rip up a pad or anything like that. I mean, not that that's much of a risk anyway. Anyway, the next step is we want to put in, I have to remember, we want to put in these little yellow squares. They're, they're the film capacitors. C1, C2 and C3. No. C1, 3, C, and C3, C5, sorry. So, let me just see if this is on camera. So, we'll just put these in. It's quite hard to get this wrong because they're. These are also not polarised. They can go in either way round. And there's not really uh, any holes you could actually put them in. Quite easy. Looks like that. We'll just solder those. Tops. The cutters are a bit blunt. Okay. Now we want to put in the smaller electrolytics here. They are C2 and C7, they're 10 microfarads. These components. Now these are polarised. If you look under the microscope, that stripe means negative. And if there isn't a stripe, it's positive. If you look at the other end, there's a short leg and a long leg. The short leg is negative, but don't worry too much about that because you can just use the body of the capacitor. Now, I'm not sure why, but strangely, convention in electronics, convention, is we mark the positive on the capacitors, which is a bit confusing. So, the stripe edge goes in the one that isn't signed positive. And you can see the circle matches the diameter, so you d so it's quite easy to find where they go. They're both the same value. Bend the legs out. Yeah, this kit doesn't matter too much because about because there's not many components with the same shape but different values. Everything's quite intuitive. That's why it's good starting out. We'll just solder those in. Out of focus. Be careful with these ones because the pads are quite close together. I did try and find, try and find, um, try to find uh, capacitors with wider part legs, but it, they just don't like making those. These are two millimeters apart. It's all right. Just don't put too much solder on. If you join them, run a soldering iron between, run your soldering iron between, and you might be able to s separate them. Or you could use this, which is solder wick. It will suck up the solder. Another tool that 
isn't essential, but you might find you need if you go wrong. I'm not giving a fantastic tool guide. There's plenty of those out there on when you're soldering kits. All right. Next part is the big, big one. Same, same thing. Looks exactly the same. Has a stripe, a negative stripe for the negative end. Short leg, long leg. On the board, it's marked positive. So the stripe goes on the one without marked positive. Should just fit in. Make sure you go right down so it sits flush with the board. Oh, this has got a bit bent. I'll take it in and out of the uh, kit bag a few times just to make sure. Okay, bend the legs out, solder it. Turn on the light. Okay, that did nothing. Let's take us. Solder, solder, solder. Now, we've done all the components, now it's time for sockets. The next thing I recommend doing is, yep, yeah, putting in the IC socket. Um, it's quite hard to hold them in and solder them at the same time without burning yourself. But I recommend doing this, where you fold over the pins to hold it in place. So the socket's on the foam, square protect its pins. Now this is polarised. We look at the socket, just gone out of focus. It's got a small one side, it's got a small notch on it. See, see there? The other side is flat. That corresponds on the, with the IC. That has a notch on the flat side. It also has a circle saying denoting pin 1. If you look at the PCB, it's exactly the same shape. The notch is there. So, so socket has to fit in like this. If you get this the wrong way round, it doesn't matter too much. Don't like attack it and try and remove it, it'll work. Just make sure you put the actual IC in the right way around, because it can actually go in both ways. But do try and get this the right way around. Now hold it with your finger, and then use your thumb to bend two opposing corners together like this. I've done it opposite to the instructions on the website. See that? It's holding in now. And we'll solder that. much harder to solder in video like everyone always says there we go Be 
careful these two don't touch each other. Although I don't think it matters. Yeah, just be careful, but I think they're actually connected anyway. There we go. Now, the next step is to put it in the power connector. This is also goes in a certain way around. You can get it in the wrong way around. This would be bad if you got it in the wrong way around. It's quite hard to remove them. You'd have probably have to destroy the connector. So be really careful here. You see on the connector, there is a notch. And on the other side, there's nothing. That notch goes where this notch is. Now, you, the pins are really thick on this, so you can't bend them over. What you can do, I'll show you in the main camera. One trick you can do is you can get a big lump of blue tack and just squish it all down and then solder it like that. It's what a lot of people do. But I quite like to, because I'm lazy and I can't be bothered to find any solder, I just do exactly what they tell you not to do with soldering irons. I put a blob of solder on the iron first, hold in the connector, making sure the notch is facing outwards, and then just tab the corner. That way it's held in. Then what I do is on the opposing corner, solder that, and then I check, is it flush? It's not quite flush, so I push down on the connector and melt that corner and then do the same on the opposite corner oh it is flush just to make sure it goes in now it's quite now I'm flat in now it's flat in I can just do all the other tabs Remelting the one I did at the first place because it wasn't a proper joint. They tell you not to put solder on the iron first because you need to heat up the joint first. But it's okay if we then remelt it afterwards, it makes the solder joint proper. Proper. There we go. Now that is all the components in. You see? Apart from the jack and the potentiometer. They go in the other side because the way it's designed is the panel like that all the components face backwards and the jack and the pot go there that gives enough space for the speaker to just about fit underneath and yeah that's basically it these some of these components wouldn't fit if they were the other way around and uh, the jack and the pot wouldn't be the right height so what we need to do is put them in this side. Now, back to which way around are we going to do it? So, I want to do it the way it's designed to be, which is the jack in the left. So I turn the PCB with the components facing downwards. Now, the jack is going to go here. This, you can see the jack goes into, into, into the holes that are like small oblongs and the circular holes are for the pot that helps you differentiate which component goes into which so the pot is going on the right this footprint isn't fantastic I need to work on making it better you can put the put the pins in first and then slide in this back. This should hold in. 
like that. See the components underneath? And then the pot goes here. Problem with the pot? Uh, we could try bending the legs. Yeah, if you bend the legs, you can get it to hold in. It doesn't hold itself in though. Be careful not to put the pins, the pot pin, the jack pins into these holes. It goes into this square one. So now we'll solder this. Uh, sorry, I just dropped my microscope. Zoom in. Okay, that's not going to hold up. I'm afraid I'm going to have to do it from a distance. Be really careful here. Make sure everything's in level. It's a good idea to do that is to just to do for the jack. Do two opposing ends. Check that it's in. If it's not, push down on the pot and remelt it so it's flat push it in you know like this melt melt push and same with this you've got to check that this is not see we don't want it to be wonky we want it to be like that <clears throat> so we'll solder all those All done. Cut this off. Don't have to cut these off. I won't bother. So you see, now we can think about doing the panel. Let me just go to get rid of those. Now, to do the panel. Remember which side is the back. This is the front because we're doing jack on the left. Because jack is the small hole. So we're going to flip the panel over. I'm going to put on the speaker with the um, terminals at the top. And then all you have to do You'll need a screwdriver. Holding the jack, the nut, like this, put it in. It's a bit fiddly. might want to tighten it up a bit later on you can do that even when the um, panel is assembled for now we're just getting it in okay so there's our speaker now we want to put in the PCB, so it goes like that. The jack has just has a hex nut, it screws onto it. Put 
pot has a washer and a hex nut. You could skip the washer if you wanted to. It's just included because they come with it. Use a spanner. Be careful not to scratch the panel. Here we go. Now all we need to do is solder the wire like this. Trim it. Trim it so it's to just beyond the terminal. Split it. Strip about five mil off each end. It's a good idea to. It's always a good idea to tin tin the ends. We didn't do that for the pads because it's easier to feed them to the holes without a big lumpy bit of solder on the end. And then the stripe should go on positive. Let's turn the microscope back. Oh yeah, it fell over. If you look, it's quite faint. I don't know if I can show you this. It's going closer. Embossed. You can't see it, but embossed, very faintly, there is a positive. Oh, you can kind of see it there, and a negative solder. Now be careful here, you don't want to heat the speaker up too much. You solder the stripe onto there. Onto the positive. I did find if you heated the speaker up too much it sounded a bit funny afterwards. Like it's response changed. It still works, but yeah, and that's it. That is everything soldered. The only thing we've got left to do is the IC. Now, be careful of static. You could try touching a radiator or something beforehand if you live in quite a static area. I've got static straps. This is a static mat. I mean, it's this chip is probably fine, it's probably quite well protected, but it's always worth avoiding these kind of things. You have to, when you get these chips, especially new ones, I'll show you the pins are slightly sticking outwards, they're not straight. The trick you, to straighten them is just to gently bend them on the table. That way it's straighter and we can then fit it in the socket. Now remember which way round it goes. The notch is facing inwards. It goes in like that. There we have it. Now what do you do? It's finished. Do you want to just plug it straight into your rack? I'm not sure if you'd want to, especially if it was a mistake and you have a dope first style fused rack uh, you might end up blowing the fuses in it if there was a short trick a really simple test to check that everything's all right here's a cheapo three pound multimeter from ebay this one only has resistance you can just does it have resistance yet yeah. Switch it to 20k. And now, if I show you the connector, a Eurorec power connector 
has negative 12 and positive 12 and ground. Negative 12 is always pin 1 and pin 2 by the red stripe. I've marked it here on the PCB. So that is negative 12. That's not used in this design. So you, that is totally disconnected. Then these six pins are ground and this is 12 volts. We only use 12 volts on ground. So if we put our probe, you could just jam it in between the six and touch another probe. On 12, you see there's nothing. There's no resistance is being picked up. If we turn it to 200K, nothing. If you have a slightly better multimeter, where's, where's it gone? Like this one, this is still a cheap possible one. It should have beep mode. This is a great one to see if something's connected to something else. Like if there's a low um, resistance path, obviously there isn't because we just did resistance test. But we could do that here. So if we put this in ground and this in twelve, get nothing. If I touch the if I touch the ground, connected. So that basically tells us that it's okay. It should work. Another test you can do, well, is you could try using, because this is only single supply, we're not using minus 12, we can, if you have a bench power supply, if you're lucky enough, you can, or even like a little 9 volt battery, you could, uh, connect it up sorry this is a bit impromptu Just getting out some these things DuPont connectors We have them with female on one end and uh, male on the other end. And we can connect that to 12. We'll connect the orange one to 12 and the grey one to ground. See? Red stripes, negative 12. Ground is on the grey and orange is on 12. And we can use our multimeter, set it to current mode. So we'll do DC amps, we'll set it to 20 milliamps, no we, want, we need more than that, 200 milliamps, you need, to, you need to move your probes to amps, oh, oh look we're on amps already, oops, oh that means the uh, voltage test wasn't working, she did that, uh, the resistance test wasn't working, let's do that. See here, I'm going to do the resistance test again because we didn't do it properly last time. Do negative there, positive there, nothing as we hoped. The reason it does nothing is because uh, the voltage this is outputting is below the threshold at which this turns on, I think. 
but oh and, and again I didn't do it right sorry uh, here we go so we do get a reading but it's going up and up that's that's the um, capacitor charging as the capacitor charge goes up and it's short circuit so now I'll put it on current mode probe in current God, it looks like I don't know how to use a multimeter put it on to 200 milliamps we put this test isn't totally necessary it's just if you're worried about connecting um, up to your module you might want to check this first and you don't have a test situation you can put the positive power supply on the positive probe. The negative, put it on the negative side of the power supply. And then if we connect the negative of the multimeter to the positive of the, um, the um, power supply, we turn on our power supply. 12 volts and connect it. Oh, we turn on the power supply, connect it. You see, I'm getting 0 0.01, which isn't the best reading. Not reading anything. Let's get a better multimeter. Even this. simple resistance test will do it's just I'm just showing you this because I, I can put it on amps put on milliamps set the multimeter to 200 milliamps and then we put the positive side of the power supply onto the positive of the probe the negative of the module goes into the negative of the power supply. Then can we connect the negative of the multimeter to the positive of the power supply? There we go. Five milliamps. So this module is con consuming five milliamps when nothing's in it. That is exactly what you'd imagine. That's exactly what you should be seeing if it's connected properly. If it's something crazy like a hundred milliamps or over an amp, this is definitely drawing way too much power. And so you need to have a look, check all your joints, see if nothing's shorted, stuff like this. You might not have the tools to do this, but um, yeah, put plug it into some a, a system that's well protected. You, you get some power supplies will um, turn themselves off if you draw too much current. Or ideally, you get a power supply, a bench power supply that has current limiting in it. Generally, though, if you've built this properly and you can see that everything is, there's no shorts, anything like that, it should be totally fine. Great. So I hope I didn't confuse you too much at the end. But um, that's how you build it. There will be another video showing this, how this works. Oh! I missed one thing. There's one more component left. The pot knob. Put if you turn it, if you turn the knob until there's a dent. That is the um center point. And you want to put the knob down, push it on 
facing exactly vertical. Now, during operation, this has been designed so when you put feed in a five, a, a, five, a ten volt peak to peak signal, so plus minus five volts, which is the Euro rack standard, at fully um, twelve o'clock, that is the maximum volume you can get out of it before you're overpowering the chip. If you want it to be if your signal's a bit quieter than five, 10 volts peak to peak, you can turn it a little bit beyond that notch. Or if you want a bit quieter, you go a bit to the left. Generally though, if you know your signal is probably five volts peak to peak and you're like up here, after a few hours you might find it gets very warm. But um, generally it should be quite safe. Even if you are overdriving it, it I drove it for quite a while and it didn't break. But safe, the safe place is like that. You shouldn't need to worry too much about it. Um, anyway, I hope that helps. Cheers.